This is Navajo Grandma. I am still in Chaco Canyon. And this is the part two of my grandfather and um, my great great grandfather and my great grandfather and my grandfather who have a history here in Chaco Canyon. And it's our family legacy. I wanted you to see Grandpa. This is my great grandfather his name's Raphael Mescalito if you can see his name here let's see my, my fingers are on it and he is the one that's sitting he's kneeling right here okay the far left corner right here and this is Raphael Mescalito that is my great uh, grandfather he is the father of Mescalito, my grandfather. You know who he is. Now, I don't have a picture of my other grandfather. Now, I'm going to give you a little pedigree of them. And here is great-great-grandfather, and that his name is Broad Rim Hat, okay? We know he was born in 1843, but we don't know where. All I know is he was born here somewhere, and where he died, we don't have that information. He's my great-great-grandfather. Then there's Raphael. Uh, let me just do this. Then there's my great-great-grandfather, my great-grandfather, who is Raphael Mescalito, and he was born 1868 and probably in Cabazon, I'm, I'm thinking, or here in uh, New Mexico. And he died in 1945. Okay. Then there's Grandpa. I told you my sad story about him that I wasn't able to go to his funeral. But he was born. His, he's my Nolly who walks on water. And he was born in 1891, July 15th in Cabazon, and then April 1st, 1976, he, was, he died in Gallup, New Mexico. And what I gave you was a timeline, okay, of what was happening here, what happened was happening in Spain, the cause and effects of the Spanish conquest, as well as the white people, the ranchers, the homesteaders, you know, archaeologists, you know, people who were trying to survey this this place and finding and discovering Navajo land or the Diné, Dinebikeya. And so it was like very palatable to them and it was horrible. Now, the situation now, it was not only for political gain, it was not only for money to be had and uh, anything else. Uh, it was also political, and it was also religious, okay? So all of those different things that were playing a part in uh, this this whole area, this the San Juan Basin region, and this is kind of the heart of the part of it. Now, we were talking about how they put together versions of different people, you know, gathering sources and information. And I was telling you that not only were the Navajo elders, uh, you know, the old people, their versions, the ranchers, the records that were made, um, the uh, problems that were occurred, uh, that occurred because of alcohol. There's, there were records all around and also it was incredible that the Navajo or the Diné people's records coincided with what history that the white people had created. And they were really surprised how, how you know, accurate they were. Now, I was telling you, after they did that, there was a Weatherill era, okay? Richard Weatherill, um, he, was, he, he was here. Um, Actually, he started in Colorado, excuse me, and he, it, he started in 1849, and, well, actually, let's start with 1849, 
And again, I, I explained to you, there was a late Lieutenant James H. Simpson who led a Washington expedition. It was a military reconnaissance team, and they surveyed Navajo lands and records and cultural sites in Chaco Canyon and all around. And then they had illustrations made. Artists and photographers came about 1877. And they produced maps of the of Chaco Canyon, of other places. And uh, then in 1888, Richard Weatherill uh, and Charlie Manson, what they did was they find Mesa Verde, the cliff dwellers in uh, in Colorado. And so they started, uh, you know, excavating that place. And basically, um, and while that was while he was there. There was a gentleman by name Victor Cosmos Mendenhoff. He was from the Bureau of American Ethnology who came here and was mapping and doing all kinds of things as well, surveying and photo but doing photography. Well, so you move further, and in 1896, Richard Weatherill begins extracting or uh, uh, excavating Chaco Canyon. Now, at that time, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, Raphael Mescalito, was 22 years old, and Broad Rim Hat was 53. Now, there is a place, when you come through, right here in the opening of Chaco Canyon, it's a place, a mesa is called uh, Chakra Mesa, and Grandpa was living there. They had come from uh, Cabazon and moved here, and uh, they were farming, they were doing all kinds of stuff here. And so he, they were present right here. And ironically, uh, Richard Weatherill was across the way. We're at uh, Rio Rinconada. I think this is where we are. This is where we, uh, this, the uh, summer solstice happens right here in this Pueblo. But across the way is Pueblo Benito. And that's where Richard Weatherill had his house built and little store and et cetera and his uh, cemeteries beyond that. So anyways, um, basically uh, he, he went on ahead and grandpa helped uh, grandpa and my great grand, my great great grandfather and my great grandfather and my, fa my, gra my grandfather who was about not, uh, 13 years old at the time uh, came and they started digging all of this place up. Now all of this place, these were just plastered over with sand. They, they just had things jutting out. And so it took an, an immense bunch of labor to be cleaning this out. In fact, there's a little video of my grandpa, Raphael, and we'll try to squeeze that in some in a, in a later video where you can see him. He was tall. Uh, I hear he was about 6'3 or 6'4. My grandfather was 6'2. And then my dad uh, was, uh, now, I don't know if how tall great-great-grandfather Broad Rim Hat was, but I know my dad came out Shorty McMorty. He was only 5'10". But anyway, so, and um, my, my children are all, you know, one of them is 5 or 6'2", six 6'3". Six but anyways, and so, and again, I'm the Shorty, but... As, as, as Richard Weatherill is, is excavating here, my grandfather, Mescalito, being a child um, and being taught the medicine men way, way of life, uh, he was, they, were, they worked with Richard Weatherill. And like I said, they, there were notches in these places. They would find jewelry, uh, old jewelry, uh, different pots. And they also had to be very careful because there were people who were stealing. They would, you know, drape down over, take the, the ropes and come down and, and they would at night, you know, grab as much as they could, hoist it back up and they would sell it in, in, in the black market or to other people. And it was horrible. So they were dealing with stealing, people stealing and things like that. And added to that... Uh, you had the ranchers, like I said, they're picking anywhere they want. This is Navajo land, hello, Denebikeya. And they just come in here and just decide, okay, we're gonna move here. We're gonna move over there. We're putting up our ranch here. Horrible, without any care. So then uh, there's pets are budding. 
There is a guy with a distillery introducing alcohol to the Navajos. Hello, that was even, that was the worst thing that he could have done. Thus, I told you, there are now documents of criminal, of crime and arguments and fights. Notice that those were things that it started um, bringing the worst out of people and that's what alcohol does, I'm sorry. Um, so then in 19, um, there's a whole phase of that that is so interesting because in the video, uh, when you come here, you see all of the specifics of how they excavated. It's incredible. Some walls were broken down and my grandfather helped uh, take the cement and cemented, and he knew how to do all the masonry. It was incredible. And you'll see what he does with it later. So, uh, with that said, my grandfather was always helping and doing things, working hard, rebuilding, you know, putting the timbers back up and, and uncovering. And, but they were very honest and really good workers. And that's what they were known for. And so at least my grandfather, and he was also, he became the chapter president for when the chapters started happening. They were the chapter houses that were, took care of the people in the area. And like my grandfather became a chapter president, Mesquilito Nelson, and then, and then he went forward and became a Navajo Nation councilman. And that's what the chapter presidents do. They go to the Navajo Nation and they plead for and behalf of their people, whatever is happening economically and health wise, you know, infrastructure wise or whatever, and they take it back. Technically, that's what you're supposed to be doing. A lot of these people uh, nowadays, it makes you wonder what they do uh, to protect and help and bless their families that in the communities. Usually people are jealous of each other and they're tearing each other down. It's really sad. It happens in the, in the Navajo culture as well. So, um, in 1910, the sad part is that Richard Weather Weatherill gets shot and killed by a Navajo. And um, I know my grandfather had a hard time with that because he, you know, I know he thought of Richard Weatherill uh, as a good man. He protected. Uh, Richard Wood did not want to have all kinds of these, you know, pots and things, everything taken. And, uh, but the Museum of History, Washington, D.C. was a glutton and other countries were a glutton and they shared and who knows, there are, I'm out in Germany, Russia, who knows? Everybody has our, our relics. Even Dubai, I hear, has some, you know, it's ridiculous. Everywhere, took all this stuff from here. And I'm sure they paid a pretty penny too. It, it happened to be money, money and sharing and whatever. So uh, the era came to an end in 1910, but the, it continued in 1920. Within those 10 years, they were still, uh, the work was slow, but eventually the uh, Conservation Corp, sorry, it, there's a lot to remember. And they're the ones that was created by Roosevelt. And because my grandfather was such an honest, good worker, um, and he knew him, because remember, he's the one that took the gold uh, for him to Mexico. And so he, he assigned him to pick uh, about 14, 15 people. And in this picture, I told you uh, to, uh, let me hunt for that right now. The picture of, this is the CC Corp. And if you see, it says, CC mobile unit in 1930, in 1938. Okay, can you see that? I don't know if you can see all that, but, and this is the group that my grandfather, my great grandfather Raphael put together and because he was so trusted. And so anyways, uh, then in 1901, right before, um, nine years before Richard Weatherwill was killed, um, it, this place was uh, told, uh, they created a national park and they said to preserve the sites and whatnot. But it's really important to know the real story. The one thing that my grandfather, uh, again, like I said, he had, uh, he was very reverent and there were 12 men. He was the 12th, I would say. 
and uh, they would all come to his to a hogan and because i was little and i was non non menstrual that i could be there of course i hung on a grandpa's leg out 24 hours a day and i was you know i told you i was like hanging on to him or or my biggie and so whenever they would go to these meetings everybody would uh do this go to the sweat lodge cleanse themselves and then they would go ahead and they would come together very reverently and they would share the history of their life and what the oral histories that were handed down. They all would take out their seer stones. Some of them were crystals, some, some of them were different. Some of them was beautiful round turquoise and they didn't all look the same. I, I know the ones I saw. I used to sit behind, pretend this is grandpa's shoulder and I'd sit behind him and I'd look and I'd watch, you know, cause I was little and I would watch and look around and see who had what kind of stone. And from that, they would actually um, see, you know, what happened. Or they would pray and they would, uh, they would explain what they were seeing. And it was, it was amazing to listen to them. There was a rendition of, um, it, it was sad. I mean, it was not sad. When Marietta Weatherill found some of the men that Grandpa had hired, and Grandpa was probably there, um, one time during lunch, they were drawing in the sand, and they, were, they drew what she deemed like, as she says, that, that looks like Jerusalem. There were palm trees. They were drawing palm trees and elephants and water boats. She said, where, where did you get this? I mean, look around you. I keep saying this. Where do you have, see a, an elephant here? Where do you see palm trees here? Good gracious, the only thing you see is the grease wood and what else? You know, the flowers. And there was no water. I mean, she says, where did you get this? Just right across the way. That's what they were drawing. And, and they said, well, this is our oral history. This is where we came from. Now, this is the part that everyone always asks me. How do we fit with Christianity? And this is now, remember, this is my teachings, okay, from my grandfather and what he taught with the men that were in the circle. And his uh, explanation was that, and they all knew this rendition in Navajo. It was absolutely beautiful. Sometimes even as a child, I used to cry because it was, it was, it was explained so beautifully. So anyways, they would tell, each one of them would explain a certain part and it went like this, that there was a great God and they uh, whipped him, they heard him and they took him because he was such a good man and they were against him because they thought he was pro he would probably take the law from them and become their you know the, the, was their their own um, fears that they had, and they took him and they put him and hung him on a cross. Now, Grandpa said it wasn't a cross; it was a tree, and his blood ran, and um, they said that wherever the 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 blood the blood ran, there were people who had who were in cemeteries that were raised from the dead. People who had probably leprosy or sickness of any sort, they were healed immediately. People who were blind, you know, touched it and, you know, they, were, they could see, they were healed immediately. And then Grandpa said, the lightning, when you hear this rendition, it's kind of, it's very powerful that the heavens, the thunder and the lightning, it was dark and the earth shook and, you know, everything was, it was, it was a mess. I mean, it was very fearful. And because like my grandfather and they explain in that rendition um, that the earth knew that their savior and Mother Earth, all the elements who loved him and obeyed him, knew he, he was being crucified.
So, there's only one other person, I think it was Kelsey Begay, that I think he, when he was a speaker at the house, I think it was him that I called and he just passed away. He knew the rendition and he, he said it to me over the phone and I cried again. I don't know who else knows. But um, it was so beautiful. And I'm sad because I tried to, I should have gone, like I told you, should have, could have, I should have gone over there to record him so you could hear. It is absolutely beautiful. Now, I don't know who else knows, but I hope if anybody, you know of anybody that knows that oral story, the history of the crucifixion, Christ's crucifixion, please let me know. So, in, in the Dene Bazad. So then um, they talk, he talks, and the men talk about how there was a, uh, the, the people, because there were people who wanted to uh, control them and, uh, you know, they wanted to uh, come and they, they wanted to, there was a conquest. So there, what happened was they said the families started to, to leave and there was, some of them, they left on a ship, and they came here to this land. And in the scriptures, it talks about that. And about 400 AD, um, there were such bad, horrible things that were going on in this land, in, within the families, that the families started to break apart, and people left and into tribes. And... If you notice that whenever I was explaining about Chaco Canyon, Chaco Canyon was flourishing between 900 A.D. and 1150 A.D. So the people had moved here at that time and the different tribes had moved here. And so um, there was at that, like again I said, uh, Chaco Canyon was flourishing during that, those times. So it gave them time if they, you know, the people to move out here. Uh, from the east and so th that is what I'm going to share with you um, it's very interesting to hear the beautiful rendition and how at that time when the people were here that they had Christ come and walk Christ probably walked here and he healed the sick and probably came and sat here could have anointed, you know, these people and blessed them and maybe had a sacrament with them. But he showed them, you know, he said, here, there's the greasewood. You know, you can make a mix, you know, use that as a sacred, you know, offering and a blessing to your home that you will never go hungry and that you can use that to stir, use, create your stirring sticks. And there's other things out here, the juniper and how he blessed and showed them how to use these herbs and all these plants for their use and their healing and their food. And uh, it was just marvelous to hear what was, um, explained to me by my grandfather and listening to these men.